Actually, it's a mistake. There's nothing funny about marriage. It's very serious. And we should stop making jokes about wives and husbands. It's blasphemous. We should have respect for wives and husbands. I don't know how, but we should. <laughs> what is funny about marriage is that being married is such a divine, godly way of life that the average human being has no business even dreaming about getting married. How do we pull off divine? It's a match made in heaven? Well, then it's not going to work on earth. <laughs> we are earthy people. How are we supposed to pull off a heavenly relationship? And yet it is possible. It's doable. And it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. So let's take a look at what marriage is all about. First of all, why do you get married? <laughs> I know you're thinking, now you ask? <laughs> Where were you when I needed you? <clears throat> why do we get married? Imagine a man says to a woman, please marry me. I can't live without you. Should she marry him? <laughs> there, there was this comedian who said, I don't trust men. I learned not to trust men. Because I had a boyfriend and he said if I ever left him he would kill himself. So I left him. <laughs> They never do what they promise. <laughs> so if a man says, please marry me, I can't live without you, he's lying. He can live without you. But what if he's sincere? Well, then you really don't want to marry him. <laughs> he needs therapy, not a wife. If you can't live without me, you got some serious issues. So, imagine if a man says to a woman, please marry me, I can live without you. <laughs> now you got an honest man. A single honest man. <laughs> so, to say I can't live without you is no good. To say I can live without you is also no good. What's a man supposed to say? Nothing? <laughs> you want to marry me? <laughs> As we spoke during Shabbos, a man should say what God says. I can exist without you, but without you, it's not a life. Because that's the truth. Why do we get married? Because to be alone is not a life, even if your existence is perfect. See, marriage is a divine affair. You got to talk like God to get married. <clears throat> when you get married, what is supposed to happen? If you're getting married in order to make yourself healthier, stronger, more noble, if it's a self-improvement project, it's not going to work. You get married when you don't see any way to improve. You're as good as you're going to get. Now it's time to get married. In other words, when you think you're perfect. When you think you're perfect, it's time to get married. 
Some people think, one, when I'm perfect, I won't need to get married. See, that's not right. You get married when you're perfect. Now, how do you convince her <laughs> that you're perfect? <laughs> See, that's the trick. You got to find someone who thinks you're perfect. But if they think you're perfect, they got some issues. So we got the same problem in reverse. <clears throat> what is it that creates that chemistry, for a lack of a better word, that makes a man and a woman want to marry each other? A guy calls me up and he says, I'm going out with this girl. She's fantastic. Great in everything. She's just perfect. But I'm hesitating for some reason. I don't know why. I said, I know why. She doesn't need you. What can you bring? What can you offer? <clears throat> Finding virtue in a person is not a reason to marry them. So let's, let's, let's get that idea straight in our minds. You want to marry somebody who is good, who is decent, who is responsible, who is loving, who is thoughtful, who is strong, intelligent. Yeah, you want to marry that kind of a person. But when you meet that kind of a person, what is it that's going to, that's going to create that, that bond or that click? The fact that they're intelligent, they're good, they're kind, they're decent, they're thoughtful, that means that you could marry them. But why would you? So you say, I married him for his intelligence, for his strength. No. Then you're marrying something about him, not him. So let me ask you something. A man comes to a woman and says, I love you. You're so rich. <laughs> I want to marry you for your money. Anything wrong with that? No good? Huh? <laughs> Look, she has money. He loves money. Match made in heaven. She has what he needs. <laughs> so what's wrong with that? So most people say, well, what happens when he loses the money? Hmm. What if you marry her for love? And you lose the love. Same problem. It's more likely she loses the love than the money. <laughs> so money is a safer bet. Money is also more useful. <laughs> so why would you marry somebody for love? Marrying somebody for money is not only a bad idea, it's really in insulting and, and disgraceful. When a man says, Ma I'll, I want to marry you for your money, it's a thinly disguised, a thinly disguised request for money. Because what he's really saying is, you know, in a perfect world, you would just give me the money. I wouldn't have to marry you to get the money. But, you know, nothing's perfect in this world. So in order for me to get the money, I guess I'm going to have to marry you. It is so insulting. It's so disrespectful. But the same is true with love. I love you and you love me. Let's get married. No. Not a good idea. A young couple came to me and said, we're very much in love. Will you do the wedding for us? 
I said, you want to get married? They said, yes. I said, why? They said, because we're in love. I said, no, so good enough. If you're already in love, it's too late for marriage. Because you're marrying for love, which you already have. So what are you getting married for? For the last hundred years, I think since Tevye in Anatevka, everyone who got married got married for love. Our marriage is stronger, deeper, more lasting now? <laughs> Not at all. Because you're marrying for love and you already have the love. The marriage is only going to take it down. So if you're already in love, leave it. What are you getting married for? <laughs> so some people say, well, to, to, to be committed. To be committed? <laughs> well, what does that mean? It means you're going to stay together even when you stop loving each other? No, you won't. You're getting married for love. So look, what is wrong with saying I want to marry you for your money? If you want to marry me for my money, you're lying. You don't want to marry me. You just want the money. You're marrying the money, not me. And if you want my love, you're marrying the love, not me. Because love, money, passion, security, these are all things. So you want something from me. And to get it, you're going to marry me. But you're not marrying me. You're marrying this thing that you want from me. <clears throat> so if a woman, if a wife asks her husband, what do you love about me? Husbands don't answer. <laughs> Stay away. It's a trap. Because <laughs> no matter what you're going to say, <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> Why do you love me? Oh, you're beautiful. You're so shallow. My looks, that's it? No, no, of course not. <laughs> no, it's your intelligence. My intelligence? You love me for being intelligent? No, 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 no. Uh, your mother. <laughs> I love your family. Your mother is just... Look, whatever you're going to say, it's going to be wrong. Because whatever you're going to say is going to be something. It's not going to be her. So what she wants to hear you say is, just you. I just love you. Yeah, well, what do you love about me? No, 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 no. Not about you. I just love you. She won't know what to say. <laughs> it's the only safe answer. The only safe answer is to say, I don't know. I just need you. Because really, that's the truth. Marriage means I need you in my life. What about me? No, nothing, not about you. You. So back in 1990, I published a book called Doesn't Anyone Blush Anymore? by Harper, San Francisco. They ask you, the publishers, ask you to give a list of possible titles. I gave them a list. Blush was one of them, but I didn't prefer that one. My, t my favorite title, which I wanted to call the book, which is on relationship, I wanted to call it, Shut Up, I Love You. <laughs> because in most marriages, this is a problem. I love you. I married you because I love you. I want you to love me. Can you just shut up and love me? I don't need your opinion. 
I love you because I love love. Do you have to have an do you have to have a personality? If you didn't have a personality, I would, would this would be perfect. If you didn't have an opinion, this would be perfect. So just shut up and let me love you. And we'll be happy. In other words, if I marry you for love, I don't want the rest of you. I don't need your opinion. When you marry, you marry a person, not something about the person. And in fact, that's the definition of intimacy. Intimacy. You know, Jackie Mason has a hilarious routine. And all his routines are funny because they're all true. He presents it in a funny fashion, but it's all wisdom. It's really true. Like, for example, he says he goes to California, people are sitting around doing nothing. And he wonders, how do they make a living? They're always sitting in the cafes and talking. So he went over to one of them and said, don't you have a job? And they say, yeah, we're, we are producers. We're producing a movie. And we're discussing where to put the sex scene. So he asks them, every movie has to have a sex scene. Why? And they say, because the movie is a simulation of reality. And in life, people have sex. He says, yeah. People also have soup. <laughs> that is such a devastating observation. Why doesn't every movie have to have a soup scene? <laughs> Tastefully done, of course. <laughs> Not vulgar slurping of soup. You know. <laughs> and then he says, and by the way, more people have soup than sex. <laughs> no one ever said soup, no, I got a headache. So really, the question is, the question of the night, what's the difference between soup and sex? I bet, I bet you don't know. <laughs> there was this guy who came to a program, a weekend program, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't let the women alone. He, would, he thought he was some kind of a Don Juan. And anyway, so I, I took him aside and I said, I'm going to ask you a question because you look like you might know the answer. What's the difference between soup and sex? <laughs> he said, what? He said, what's the difference between soup and sex? He says, I, I don't know. <laughs> I said, oh, you don't know? I'm so disappointed. You look like the type that would know. <laughs> and by the way, if you don't know the difference between soup and sex, stay out of the kitchen. <laughs> What is the difference between soup and sex? The real difference is soup is a thing. Sex is a non-thing if it's intimate. But what, is, what is presented today as sexual behavior, that's soup. And I don't know if you heard about this, but People have had enough soup. Gets a little boring after a while. And it is. People are not having sex. According to the Pew studies, the average couple are intimate maybe once a month. This is not healthy. This is how a society becomes extinct, by the way. But truly, the Romans disappeared, the Greeks disappeared. Nobody killed them. They faded out because they lost interest in intimacy. So no children were born. They died out. 
This is not good. So, intimacy, by definition, is a non-thing. But Hollywood, the media, has turned it into a thing, and it's destroying marriages. Intimacy is a normal, natural, necessary human need. When you reduce it to something, it's no longer necessary. And it does not bring people together. It keeps a couple separated. Because when you're busy doing something, you lose sight of each other. A guy comes over to me during a weekend in a hotel. He says, can I ask you a personal question? Take a chance. <laughs> he says, I'm just curious. You sleep with your beard under the blanket or above the blanket? <laughs> For two weeks, I couldn't sleep. I'm serious. <laughs> I've been doing fine for years. But when he made me self-conscious, <laughs> I tried it one way, it was like... <laughs> Try the other way, I don't really see a difference, maybe try it again. <laughs> Couldn't sleep. When you become self-conscious about intimacy, it becomes a performance, becomes a thing, and that's not human. You don't use another human being for anything, even if they agree. It's not respectful. Intimacy is a non-thing. It's two people merging into each other because there's nothing separating them. When you have nothing coming between you, you merge like two drops of water next to each other. Why are there two drops? Why are they just sitting there like that? Water is supposed to flow. The answer is surface tension. Surface tension keeps each of the drops in its own shape, separate from the other one. What will it take for them to become one drop? Shake the table. Blow on it. Anything that breaks that tension, they will flow into each other and become one. So if you remove the resistance, if you remove the obstacles, you merge into each other. That's not a performance. That's not a thing. That's just us. So if you ask your grandmother, well, what happens in the bedroom? What would your grandmother say? Nothing. You say, no, come on, tell me. What happens in the bedroom? Nothing. Grandma. I'm 48. <laughs> I'm old enough, you can tell me now. Nothing. And you think she doesn't want to tell you. She actually told you the only correct answer. In a bedroom, what happens? No thing. It's a no thing zone. It's just them, just them being together with nothing coming between them. That's called intimacy. And when you achieve that, when you get past all things, including love, because love is a thing. You have it today, you, tomorrow you don't. You have more, you have less, it's a thing. But when you're merging with a person, There is no thing. 
And then you are bonded to where you, you cannot be separated. You need an amputation to separate them. And that's why we have to stop saying, I love you. It's not Jewish. I love you, it's a terrible little sentence. I is the first word. You are the last word. It's a terrible sentence. Also, what happens when a man says to a woman, I love you? What does the woman say? I love you. There they go. They're fighting already. <laughs> a man says, I love you. He's trying to tell you something about himself, not about you. And it's not easy for a man to say, I love you. He finally gets up the courage. And he says, can I tell you something? I, I love you. And you say, OK, enough about you. Now, I. Love you, see? That's all a man gets to say. Three words, and he's cut off. <laughs> it's so not nice. <laughs> if somebody says to you, I love you, he wants to talk about himself. Don't change the subject. <laughs> Stay on subject. This is about him. So if he says to you, I love you, you should say, you know, you have, you have really good taste in women. <laughs> Talk about him, because that's what he's trying to do. The right way, the right way to express love is to say, you I love. See, that's Yiddish. Sounds much more Jewish than I love you. That's Hollywood. You I love. It's about you, not about love. So under the chuppah, what does the chassan say to the kala? In a traditional marriage, traditional wedding, what does the groom say to the, to the bride? <laughs> There's this comedian who says, I never understood why at a wedding the bride wears a gown unlike anyone else in the room. But the groom wears a tuxedo just like all the other guys. They're all dressed the same. Why is that? He says, until I listen to the vows. Did you ever hear the vows? Do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? This man. They don't mention a name. Because if she says no, he's wearing a tuxedo, come on. Do you take this man? No? <laughs> well, you don't like anybody? See, we don't say that. In a non-Jewish uh, ceremony, they say, I, I promise to love you and cherish you and adore you and obey you. And you start the marriage off with lies. Where do you think it's going to go? <laughs> we don't say that. Nowhere in the wedding ceremony by Jews do we say anything about love. The groom says to the bride, you are hereby... Nobody remembers the rest. Ask any bride, what did he say? And they'll all re repeat, you are whatever, whatever. So why'd you marry him? Because he started with you. After that, it didn't matter what he said. But if he started with I, I love you and I want to be, oh, go home. 
You notice every bracha that we make, blessing on food, the blessing on a mitzvah, every bracha, how does it start? Blessed are you, not I adore you. The only exception is Modani. But that's because you're half asleep. <laughs> so if you start with you, that's healthy. You start with I, it's not going in the right direction. So from now on, say, you I love. What do I love? The you, not something about you. So we should have bumper stickers that say, nothing about your wife is more important than your wife. Nothing you get from your husband is as important as your husband. Is that true? It better be, because you're not getting anything from your husband. <laughs> what do I need him for? What does he do for me? Nothing. So why are you married to him? For him. Not for something I get from him. So this one guy said, I love everything about my wife. I said, nice. Why does she want a divorce? <laughs> Oh, she's crazy. Now, wait, wait. You love everything about your wife, like her money, mm -hmm. her looks, mm -hmm. her sense of humor, yep. her family. Mm -hmm. That means that you are married to her money, her looks, her sense of humor, and her family. That's polygamy. The only thing you're not married to is her. I said, do you really want to be married to her? What do you like about her? He said, I like everything about her. I said, no, no. <clears throat> her. Do you need her? Take away all things. I said, take away all things, what's left? There's your problem. If I am married to you because I love everything about you, you will feel alone in the world. Because I'm not married to you. So you have nothing to complain about. Because I really do love everything about you. So if you go for marriage counseling, you don't know what to say. There's nothing wrong with him. There must be something wrong with me. No. You are feeling completely alone because you are alone. He loves everything about you. He's married to those things, not to you. So what is the person when you take away all things? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. In fact, people complain, can't you just accept me for who I am? <laughs> I would gladly do that, but I don't know who you am. <laughs> who am you? And you can't answer the question. Just me. What is that? Your husband is out of town. You miss him? Yeah. What do you miss about him? What do I miss? I miss him. He's out of town. I miss him. Your wife is out of town. You miss her. What do you miss about her? I don't miss something about her. She's out of town. Not my cook is out of town. She's out of town. So when 
you miss someone, you do understand what it means, the person, not something about the person. Strange thing is, you miss your husband, just him, until the second he wants, walks in the door. The second he walks in the door, oh good, now you can. <laughs> Why can't you miss him when he's there a little bit? So, if you want your marriage to be infinitely better, here are a few suggestions. Recognize that the best thing about your spouse is that he is not you. That's not the worst part, that's the best part. The best thing about your wife is that she's not you. Otherwise, you're married to a clone. And then you're still alone in the world. The best part of the fact that your wife married you is because she is who she is. And she's willing to marry you. So you have to start appreciating the things that make her different and independent from you. That's the best part of her. We have to stop thinking in terms of things and performances, because that's what Hollywood is all about, and it's porn pornographic. We have to start being human with each other. I'm here for you. I'm yours. When we speak to each other, there's a certain tone that is appropriate for husband and wife to speak to each other. The, in, the inappropriate tone will ruin whatever you're saying. You can say the smartest and the nicest thing in the world. If it's in the wrong tone, you've ruined it. And if it's in the right tone, you can say the most ridiculous things. And it's appreciated. Because you're using the right tone. You do not talk to your spouse the same tone you use with your children. There was actually a woman who came from marriage counseling. She said, I don't know what to do with my husband. I don't know what to do with him. I'm trying so hard. And I tell him, I said, you can't do that. This is not how you do things. You can't talk to your children. like You can't drive like that. You can't. I said, excuse me, is that exactly how you talk? With the finger? She says, yeah. Do you teach kindergarten? Yeah. I said, if you want to fix your marriage, I have a very simple advice. When you talk to your husband, sit on your hand. You don't talk to your husband the way you do in classroom with your kindergarten kids. There's an appropriate tone. You don't talk to your wife or to your husband the way you would talk to uh, the pizza delivery guy. Well, actually, you talk to the pizza delivery guy nicer than you talk to your spouse. Which is another thing. You have to be modest with each other. You have to remain dignified with each other. Why, if the doorbell rings and some guy's delivering pizza, you get decent? And what were you before? <laughs> Every father says to his teenage daughter, hey, hey, you can't go out dressed like that. Can't go out dressed like that? And in the house it's fine? It's backwards. Every father should say, dressed like that, go out. Not in this house. The house should be more important than the street, no? Watch the tone. Keep the right tone. Be respectful, generous, and holy. Very quickly. Marriage is based on three pillars. A tripod. Pillar number one is generosity. 
If you want to know, am I ready to get married? Do I have what it takes to be married? The first question is, are you generous enough? Because to be married, you have to be generous. You have to be generous with your money, possessions. You have to be generous with your time. You have to be generous with your space. You have to be generous with your opinion and your words. There are people who are very generous with their money, but not with their time. Husbands who say to their wife, yeah, take the money, I have no time for this. Or people who are generous with their money and their time, but not their space. Whatever you want, it's fine, it's good. Don't cramp my space. Don't enter my space. Man cave. <laughs> Not generous with... A man says to me, my wife did something last week, she was amazing. It was so nice. I was so, I'm so impressed. I said, did you tell her? Mm, no. Why not? Mm. Never occurred to him. He's a man of few words. <laughs> Not generous with words. So to be married, you really have to be generous. You have to be comfortable sharing. That's the first requirement. Number two, you have to be respectful. You have to be dignified. You have to keep your dignity and protect the other's dignity. A Russian immigrant came to Minnesota in the 80s, old school. His Yiddish was a pleasure to, to, to listen to. And he had that old style, I don't know, aristocratic, but a beautiful way about him. His wife came down with some form of dementia. For three years, it was really, really difficult. And she passed away. We're sitting in Shiva. And he says to me, can I say that I was a good husband? In Yiddish. To say that I was a good husband? I don't know. But one thing I'm sure, I never compromised her dignity. I said, whoa, that is a mouthful. You don't compromise each other's dignity. And you don't make it difficult on the other, on your spouse, to respect you. So this notion, we got married, now I can be sloppy, now I can let my hair down, now I don't have to be nice anymore. Well, we're already married. What's the difference? You have to be kinder and more modest with each other than you are with a stranger. But then you need a third thing, and that is holiness. Holiness means the recognition that marriage is not a human idea. It's not a good idea. It's either holy or it's a disaster. There has to be a certain awareness. We are doing something that is bigger than both of us. Which means you have to respect marriage for its own sake. Marriage is holy. Don't mess with marriage. Not even your marriage. So the thought that marriage means I saw her, I liked her, I asked her to marry me, she said yes. That's it. That's not marriage, that's a roommate. Marriage means you're involved in something bigger than yourself. And that's why you have to want to get married before you meet someone you want to marry. That makes sense? So I ask a guy, you want to get married? He says, yeah. I said, when? He said, when? When I meet the right person. I said, okay, you don't want to really get married. If and when you meet the right person, you don't really believe in marriage. You want a person to convince you to be married. That's not good. 
So on a date, the first question you want to ask the person you're dating is, how do you feel about marriage? Not do you love me, do you love marriage? Because if you don't, we've got nothing to talk about. If you really want to get married, choose a date on the calendar, June, June 15th, it's a good day. <laughs> Mark it on your calendar, wedding night. When you meet a guy or a girl, you take out your calendar, first date, before you pay for the coke. You take out your calendar and you say, I I'm scheduled for June 15th. <laughs> the, the women who I suggest this to say, no, you can't do that. They'll run away. Mm-hmm. It's working. <laughs> He'll run away? He's not serious about marriage. So think about it the other way. Imagine you take out your calendar and you say, I'm scheduled for June 15th. And he says, really? Takes out his calendar. I'm scheduled for June 17th. Negotiate. <laughs> the point is, you want to be married. Who you're going to marry is just a technicality. That's how you should be thinking. Marriage has to stand on its own virtue. If you don't love marriage, don't marry anybody. This, this way of life that Americans have developed since, since Anatevka, it's crazy. It's a crazy life. I really wasn't thinking of marriage. I'm not the marrying type, but you are incredible. You I'll marry. Not a good deal. You're not that incredible. Don't do it. Don't allow him to put the weight of the marriage on your being incredible. Because when you stop being incredible, he never really wanted to be married. So he has to be in love with marriage or you don't talk to him. Every girl, nine years old, wants to get married. To whom? Not to a boy. <laughs> Hate boys. So who are you going to marry? Who cares? I just want to be married. Then all of a sudden, the changes. I don't want to be married. I want to find a special guy. <laughs> this woman said to me, you know, I've been davening, I've been praying, I want to get married. It's been six years. Where are all the guys? I said, excuse me. You can't marry all the guys. It's none of your business where they all are. <laughs> she said, no, no, I meant, I meant, you know, a guy. You haven't met a guy in six years? Where do you live? I mean, as somebody special. Haven't met anybody special in six years? Of course you have. I mean, he's married, <laughs> but he's special. She says, come on, I'm talking about the one for me. <laughs> you see how far we've come in two minutes? It started off with all the guys, and now we're down to the one for me. You know what they call the one for you? Husband. Stop looking for guys. Don't even look for a guy. You don't want to marry a guy. They're bad news. You want to marry your husband, nobody else. Okay, finding your husband could take a while. But focus. When you're praying, what are you asking God? She says, I'm asking God, I want to meet a nice guy. 
So that's a dumb prayer. Why would you want to meet him? Why can't you ask for what you really want? What, are you afraid you're making it too hard on God? You want to meet a guy? You met a guy. Now what? He doesn't want to marry you. Oh, so you got to meet another guy. Stop, stop playing games. Tell God that by June 15th, you want to be settled into your home with your husband. Okay, you got to meet a guy for that to happen. He'll take care of that. He knows how to do it. <laughs> but why can't you ask for what you really want? In the same way, a guy is praying to get a job. Don't pray to get a job. Pray to be rich. Think like a Jew. <laughs> we don't want jobs. You have to be enamored with marriage in order to be married. And you have to have respect for intimacy. Otherwise, you're going to hurt each other. In the 60s, America decided, or the West decided, that intimacy is not that important. It's fun and games. Have some fun. Free love. A disaster. If you lose respect for intimacy, there's going to be all sorts of misunderstandings between men and women. You yourself are going to get confused. It's a disaster. So now, what is it we're really trying to accomplish? The word love is highly overrated. It's the spice. It's not the relationship. When somebody is important in your life, you ought to love them. But love is not important. Love doesn't make someone important. If I love you, you're important. When I stop loving you, you're nothing. That's, that's horrible. When someone is important in your life, you ought to love them. If you don't love them, they're still important. If someone is not important in your life, but you love them, still not important. Like chocolate. Everybody loves chocolate. No one can claim that chocolate is important. Okay, maybe chocolate is. But potato chips are not. <clears throat> the more important word is mine. Be mine. I'm yours. Much more powerful than love. Love is flimsy. I'm yours. Our grandparents got married to each other not to something about the other. Were they happy? <laughs> Everybody shrugged. <laughs> we don't think they were happy because we remember them bickering all the time. But you know what they were bickering about? Things. They didn't like many things about each other. So why didn't they get divorced? Because they had each other. They were not going to give that up. So things we disagree about, that's okay. Bicker for 180 years, you'll live long. We are trying to do the opposite. We don't really want each other. We just want things from each other. So we love everything about each other, we just don't know why we're stuck with each other. So what's more powerful? Mine. Our grandparents spoke of each other as mine. In Yiddish, people would say, my wife, mein Weib. That's how they would address their wife.
my, mein Weib, mein Kind. You didn't ask a child, what's your name? You saw a child in shul, you say, whose are you? Vemens bistu. We belong to each other. Mine, I'm yours. The ultimate powerful word is home. You create a home. Home means the place where I belong. That is so powerful. Because we wander around the earth not knowing where we belong. When you create a home, that's where you belong. You come home, you're home. You're in your space, in your element, in your world. And what do you do there? What you're meant to do. Exactly what you're meant to do. And with whom? The person God chose for you. Your soul mate. So when you're home, there's no place else you'd rather be. What you do at home, there's nothing else you'd rather do. And who are you with? Someone who there is no one else you'd rather be with. That's heaven. That's heaven. When the soul goes back to heaven, it feels at home. And of course, the opposite, when you walk into your home and it's not where you want to be and it's not, that's the opposite of heaven. Just to make the point and conclude, remember the story with Antebi? The Israeli soldiers came in, they eliminated the terrorists, I think there were six, six terrorists. They eliminated the terrorists and they said to the Jews who had been there for a long, miserable time, remember what they said? Huh? They instinctively, in the heat of the moment, the moment of truth, they instinctively said the most perfect thing they could have said. Let's go home. Imagine if they had said, you know why we came here to save you? Because we love you. <laughs> like the Mickey Mouse song. Why? Because we love you. It would have been meaningless. They said, let's go home. Is there a more powerful word? What is Gullus? What is Gullus? We want to go home. We want to be where we belong, doing what we're meant to do with the person that was chosen for us. Everything else is commentary. So if you have gen generosity, kindness, and you have respect, and you know that marriage is a holy institution, you make a home. You make a home. And children who are born into that atmosphere thrive. They love it. They never want to leave. Okay, that's another problem we'll talk about. <laughs> you have to throw them out because they don't want to leave. But that itself is also a blessing. So, we should all have real, intimate relationships. Intimate means not about anything, just about you. And we use the right tone, and we stay dignified, and we don't challenge each other. See, can you love me now? Try to be lovable. Don't challenge each other. Use the right tone. Don't shout at each other from across the house. When we were growing up, we didn't, we didn't know what my, my mother's first name is. 
because you know we're not allowed to use her first name, and we never heard my father calling my mother. When he wanted to talk to her, he would go to where she was and talk. Never shout from across the room or across the house. It's not appropriate. If you bring in a little bit of dignity and a little bit of thoughtfulness, every home can be real heaven. And the children will thank you, will appreciate you, your grandchildren will speak of you. Come on, what could be better? <laughs>